Hello, good evening, welcome to another episode of Inside the Ring. This is actually episode number 10. I've made it this far. I was actually thinking today, I wonder of all the projects that have been started over the last year, I wonder how many are gonna be dropping off pretty soon. <laughs> Suddenly people are having a little less free time. So we'll see how long we can keep this show going. If you're here tuning in uh, from around the world, please let me know. You can use the chat in Facebook or if you're watching on YouTube, you can uh, just chat in the comments. Let me know you're listening. Garnet is here from Regina, Canada. Hey Garnet, thanks for tuning in again. I am also in Canada. I'm in Ottawa, Canada. And Charles, our, one of our uh, regular fans here, coming in from Cincinnati, Ohio. We've talked a lot about how much Ohio magicians and magic there is. Last, I think it was last month, I was talking about the first ever IBM convention, which was in Ohio. And uh, talking about the beautiful program they made. And we just had the IBM convention, the virtual edition. And I was quite uh, pleasantly surprised to see David Sandy holding up his first convention program booklets, the real deal. I didn't, I just had the virtual version, but uh, David Sandy has the real deal. I thought that was pretty neat. Glenn is here from Newburgh, New York. <laughs> and Garnet is hoping it, uh, it's a, it could be a whole decade if done. Yeah, that's it. I don't need to do a show once a month. I can do once a year. Way more sustainable. Excellent plan, Garnet. <laughs> So we are here tonight for another edition of Inside the Ring, which is all about digging into the pages of the Linking Ring magazine. And I was just looking to see if I had one within reach, but I don't. I, I subscribe digitally and I do all my research through the digital archive, which I encourage everyone to do. Even if you get the paper magazine, just go in and, and uh, research in the, in the uh, Ask Alexander archive. You can go back to 1933, I think is the first edition. And uh, amazing stuff. Ken is here from Atlanta. <laughs> Ken, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Ken is actually on the cover of this month's magazine. I don't know if you may have noticed that uh, on this month's cover. There is Mr. Ken Scott in uh, approximately four days from now, five days from now, he will be installed as the incoming president, well, as the president of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. So thanks for, thanks for uh, bestowing your presence upon us, good sir. <laughs> so I dig into the pages of the Linking Ring magazine and, and just try and find those things. You know, they say if you want to hide something, publish it in a magazine, but not, not here, not on my watch. I, I dig in and find the gems, the, the magicians and the magic that uh, are just too cool to be missed. So I put them on the show. Uh, we have our first too cool to be missed guy coming up right now. He has been a contributor to the Linking Ring magazine in a, in a wide array through different columns and uh, articles. He's written uh, several cover feature articles. Uh, but primarily we're here to talk about his own interest in magic as a, as a builder of uh, I said, uh, amazingly beautiful and beautifully amazing magic props. So please welcome Craig uh, Bateen on the show. Hey, Craig, thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> hey, Ryan, it's a pleasure to be here. So, Craig, uh, we might recognize your work in the Linking Ring. Uh, you have a, you had a column running for about a year and a half. Uh, I think, what would you say, it was September 2018? It yeah, it started. It started March of 2018 and ran March. through uh, December 2019, o only to end because, frankly, I just ran out of material. <laughs> yeah, it, it was uh, the column was Petite Magia, and it was all about s a small props. So you introduced in the very first column. You you called it uh, building plans for the tabletop wizard. Yeah, I you know having built a number of effects, uh, stage large stage effects as well, I, I got to a point in my building career where it was just too much work, <laughs> frankly, to build the the larger stage illusions. And frankly, there are people who are much better at it than I was. And so, I decided to kind of focus my efforts on smaller, more contained magic. You know, I've always been a a fan of of box magic. I, I don't know where that comes from. I don't know if it some you know, deep-seated psychological need to be contained. I, I don't know what it is, but uh, uh, I, I, I've always been fascinated by small apparatus. And 
a big fan of Okido, who, as you know, um, uh, Bamberg created probably more magic, original magic, in his lifetime than, than any one of his peers. And so uh, yeah. big with, kind of historical- With a very distinctive style. Yes. Uh, is his props. They're very well recognized. Absolutely. Uh, is, is that a style that, that you work in? I know uh, um, Michael Baker uh, does that style, which will- my, my, Michael is, Michael is you know, uh, <laughs> there's there's no seconds to Michael. Michael is <laughs> his first, uh, I think, on the planet, you know, and, and, and before him, you know, certainly others um, had that skill that the the use of kind of oriental transfers and that kind of style um, that Okito really um, made a signature for himself. Um, yeah. Others, of course, Norm Nielsen, uh, his wife now um, has taken on the, the job of uh, maintaining uh, his line. Um, it, it was said that Norm inherited or purchased directly from Okito some of his tools before he passed away. Um, and so he certainly had that style. Michael Baker, I think Michael, interestingly enough, um, and we spent some time communicating with Michael in preparation for the article that we that just came out this, this last issue. Um, he didn't want to copy him, but he wanted to do homage. He wanted to be respectful of that work. And I think uh, Michael's taken it to a slightly different level, um, but it's certainly reflective of the Aikido style. Yeah, and, and just so everyone's up to speed, this Okito style, when you think of it, it's it's the often red and gold boxes with the dragons and the band, like uh, the characters, and it's it's almost what they they uh, like they make fun of it sometimes when it's like a magic prop with the cheesy dragons. But this is not this is not that. This is no the, no no. The they're, original, they're very refined, the beautiful, very very precise, <laughs> um, very highly stylized. Um, the colors that Okito selected, some some have suggested it was just the available paint in the room. Um, I tend to think he was a little more strategic about it, um, combining the the light blues and the greens, and and really brought a palette to to his expression that was uh, you know to that point not reflected in a lot of magic apparatus. So, and and Michael you know has his own take on that as well. Um, I I have you know. Uh, yeah. Attempted a number of Akito's effects you know, from Akito on Magic and and the ba and and other sources. Um, I, I don't claim to have anywhere near his his style. I kind of developed my own style. I, I tend to like a little more industrial looking, more hammered finish. Mm -hmm. um, but I do employ when I I do uh, build and have built probably well over twenty five or thirty checker cabinets. And I tell you what, every one of them is different. Uh, the color is different. The size is different. The size of the checkers are different. Um, I, 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 I've not been able to kind of hone a habit uh, on what that looks like. I'm just checking in with the with the chat here. Uh, Michael Dardant says he got a he got to a yellow belt in Okido. So that's, that's <laughs> okay, oh, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, Michael yeah, I, Baker, I guess, reached a black belt. Uh, in that. Yeah, I think he's black belt. I, I think I'm probably in the blues or the greens. That's about as far as I can, <laughs> can claim. And, and I should say hi to more people. We've got uh, Dan from uh, Kissimmee, Florida. And speaking of presidents, Tom Gentile is here from Southampton, Massachusetts, president of the SAM. Thanks, sir, oh. for joining us, Tom. And Scott's from here, St. Louis, IBM ring number one. Uh, the uh, I was going to say hometown, but... Wasn't that Winnipeg? You know, how'd that work out? How did St. Louis get ring one when it started in Winnipeg? <laughs> I will research that for next month. Yeah. That's what I want to know. <laughs> so you um, you say you, you build these props, and, and you were saying earlier how uh, you, you build them in very small batches because uh, they're you know intricate props. And, and are you often designing like or building your own designs or are you trying to like go from plans that are out there um well i you know i, I when i first started building i i like many uh used paul osborne plans uh to to build and i i discovered by the way quite early on that that whether intentionally or not paul never told me one way or the other but 
um, not all of the challengers are, are addressed in the plan. Not not every dimension is a given. And so there's always a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, guesswork involved. As a matter of fact, it reminds me of a conversation I had with uh, Jim Steinmeier. Um, I had called him because I was struggling completing a, a, a modern art uh, effect. And I said, I said, Jim, I, I'm stuck. I don't quite know what this dimension is. And he said, well, in reality, Craig, I just designed them. I don't build them. So he was like, <laughs> I have no idea. You're going to have to figure it out. So now whether yeah. inten whether intentional or not, uh, it forced me to kind of get the slide rule out and uh, figure out some odd angles. But uh, um, I, I was it, I was thinking about that, actually, in preparation to talk with you. I was thinking about how, you know, close up magicians are reading a book and they they get frustrated if, you know, it's, the book isn't clear on where to hold your pinky or something like that. Uh, but I was thinking about the, the plans that I've seen in books are just like sketches. They're just like scribbled half page like how how do you go about uh taking like from an old book how do you go about adapting that to a real thing well uh, probably the best example i can give you is um eric lewis of course um very well known uh, creator of magic uh, his son martin lewis of course a contemporary performer and also creator of a number of magics uh, of, of effects um uh, in some cases, uh, there were a few old books that I was able to find descriptions and some sketches. Uh, um, I certainly have, um, you know, I, I obviously don't create a plan until I create the effect. So it's kind of reverse engineering. Um, um, I'll get an idea. Um, I'll see something. I'll observe something. Um, I'll do research on something that's perhaps uh, created originally by Bamberg. Uh, and then, you know, I'll start building. And I'll go through that trial and error process to determine exactly scale and size and so on and so forth. And then I have a rendering, in this particular case, my son, who's a draftsman, uh, will take the finished effect and dimensioned mm -hmm. and create. And that's one of the motivations behind P Petite Magia and the series that we ran in, in the magazine was I wanted to give others what I didn't have, which was dimensioned plans and a reasonable explanation as to how to build the damn thing. <laughs> uh, recognizing that there's no perfect information and there's going to be some instances where you're going to have to guess a little bit. But, you know, there's there's also some enjoyment in that process of discovery. And I've had people actually create better solutions from my plans and recommend them to me. I've been amazed at some of the really great ideas that have come out of people who have attempted one or more of my effects. Uh, one thing I remember reading from Paul Osborne and, and doing myself was there was his suggestion to first build in cardboard instead of plywood. Uh, yeah, I never did that. You never, <laughs> I was going to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was so excited to get something built. Now, when it comes to dimensioning an individual space that someone's going to hide or whatever, you know, Paul was spot on um, doing that 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 initial pre work to determine because you don't want to you know invest all this time and money into building an effect. I was building a uh, an effect that eventually got sold to Ot Ottavio Belli, who was an Italian uh, illusionist uh, in Italy, and it was involving a person sitting in Indian style and then it's being split in half. And I remember having to spend hours and hours and hours calculating what is the minimum amount of space someone can reside in. Um, and, and you know, I didn't build it out of cardboard first. I actually <laughs> built the box and then had to tear it apart and rebuild it because I, you know, it wasn't quite right. But, you know, those, those things happen. It's a process of uh, trial and error. Um, but what I tried to do with the Petite Maggio was provide enough information for someone who's really keen on wanting to build. And I've always stated that I tried to make choose effects that were, um, you know, were, were doable for the average carpenter. Uh, probably the most complex effect that was in the series was the mini me guillotine uh, because it was just so many magnets and pulleys and various elements that were part of that. Probably the most complex of all the effects, but um, you know, when you start talking about tabletop magic, precision is important, and uh, it's a matter of centimeters uh, or millimeters, not not inches, uh, to to create something that will actually work and 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 be sustainable over time. Now, uh, 
may we see an example of uh, some of these mini magic pieces? Yeah, I, uh, I think it was in the January 2019 um, uh, edition of, of The Linking Ring where I introduced and, and provided the plans uh, for the test position. I can move the camera down a little bit. This is, uh, as I, you have said earlier, this is probably what I'm best known for. Uh, we uh, created or observed um, Michael Baker and uh, uh, one of his collaborators, uh, Tyson, had created a an effect called the block appearance, vanish and appearance. And I had witnessed the effect, uh, but did not own it and said and had no way of knowing what the what the method was. Um, so I decided, well, if I wanted to do a block vanish or appearance, how would I do it? And that's kind of how I approach things is not how did they do it, but given the resources, how could I replicate? Uh, as it turned out, uh, my vanish um, approximated the vanish that, that Michael Baker and his, his uh, co-author co had created, but that the, the uh, appearance uh, was different. Um, and so um, I'll, I'll demonstrate this very, very briefly. I'll skip the pattern just to show you the effect, but what you have in effect are uh, two hewlets or holders, uh, and then you have two covers, and then you have a block uh, that is solid, has a hole through the center. The block actually fits inside uh, the first holder, and uh, on one need do is to hold up the, the two lids. And uh, so one, two, three, it's like this. And magically what happens is that block will jump from this holder uh, over to, to this holder, and then this can be handed out. Very so that's nice. the Tesseract transposition. Uh, once again, it was detailed. Uh, plans were provided in the January 2019 um, edition of, uh, of the linking ring. Wow, that's very nice. So, And, and I know uh, you've made those in a, in a wide variety of styles, right? Different colors, different uh, textures. I, I really like, uh, you might notice this is uh, hard to see perhaps on screen, but it uses a hammered um, finish. Almost looks like uh, people have asked, is this actually metal? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not. It's, it's, uh, it's actually masonite. But um, the finish is, uh, you, you cannot, and this is the one thing I learned from Okita, uh, not directly, but through his being inspired by him, is that you cannot scrimp on finishes. You need to take your time. You don't rush it. I have rushed it. I've made every mistake painter could possibly make. <laughs> um, uh, but the finishes are important. And that's what distinguishes, I think, quality apparatus from others. Uh, but yeah, I've done a, a Hellraiser version where the block is actually a Hellraiser block. Uh, that was quite popular. And as you said earlier, I make these about three at a time. And each one's a little different. Sometimes the bases are slightly different there might be uh, additional details sometimes there's uh it you know i really allow myself a little bit of uh, dramatic license if you will when i'm creating so that i don't get bored, so that i can find something of interest so that's the example of, uh, of one of the effects that was featured um you know featured in the linking very nice and i know uh i I do have uh, one of the references here. We mentioned this earlier, the, the Mini-Me guillotine uh, from December 29th. Uh, I thought that was, you said it was the most complex piece in the whole series, but I, I picked this one out because it has an interesting little uh, side story about it. Yeah, um, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I started off using a lot of Paul Osborne's plans from his Illusion Systems uh, series. And on a lark, um, I had built, I think at that point, they had built two of these. And these are three foot high replicas, if you will, of the monster guillotine that is probably best known as uh, the, the concert. Uh, um, I'm trying to remember the, the uh, artist that used to do a beheading on stage so, during uh, the Alice, Alice Cooper. Cooper. Yeah. Alice Cooper. So, this, so I, I pretty much took that plan and I said, now if I shrunk that down, to a wrist size, what would that look like? And so through trial and error, created one and finally got it to work pretty well. And on a lark, I just sent one to Paul. And I said, Paul, I'm, I, I'm a big fan. I've been following you for years. Um, he and I had also crossed paths 
I had worked a few summers at Worlds of Fun in Kansas City as a magician. Uh, Paul, as, as many, I'm sure your listeners are aware of, Paul Osborne was well known to produce a lot of the shows that appeared at Six Flags and at various amusement parks across the country. So we had other reasons to be connected. And um, I said, you know, what I'd like to ask you in, in return for this gift is would you actually draft uh, the effect in your style? And so he gifted me a, an original version of drawing out and dimensioning. Uh, and then he contacted me and said, you know, I like this effect so much. Can I add it to the Illusion Arts or the Illusion Systems series? And I said, I was delighted. I mean, I didn't want any money. I, absolutely. And so it's been in a series, I would say, going on almost 10 years. And we had, we continued to correspond back and forth. And I was, actually was in the process of putting together a book that would combine all of the uh, effects that ran in, in Linking Ring, including about 10 others, into a book. And Paul had agreed to write the uh, forward. Unfortunately, he passed away before he could write it. So um, that project got stalled due to COVID. Um, I will complete it sometime in the near future, but Agreed. it would be dedicated to Paul Osborne, who with whom uh, it was my pleasure to collaborate. He was an amazing guy. Yeah, and and there is a a reproduction of those plans in in this column, and yeah, it's they're def definitely a char characteristic style. Like you, you can recognize a Paul Osborne plan. <laughs> well, and and uh, I actually I've had at least two people attempt it. Uh, both have contacted me asking me the same kinds of questions that I asked Jim Steinmeier. The difference was I was able to tell him what to do. <laughs> <laughs> you are the designer and the builder. That's right. On that note, do you have any uh, like kind of beginner tips for those people who might want to try building some of these things? What are like the, the, the problem or the, the ways you failed early on that you can help other people with? Um, I think having the proper tools, uh, that's, I think that's important. Um, I literally, if I have a, a drill press and a table saw, um, there's not much I couldn't build that's reflected in the plans. Um, now, I would add a, a, a jigsaw, uh, a router, um, you know, and, a, and perhaps a few other things, but uh, having the right tools, um, not trying to do things that are beyond the capability of the tool you're using, I think is really important. Safety, of course, is I still have all all my fingers and digits, <laughs> although I, I nick, nicked a, a fair number uh, in the process of, of building. Um, I, I think uh, attack things that are probably simpler. Um, you know, as I reflect on the series, uh, you know, uh, rend me a hand, which was a, a very simple effect that, uh, involved creating a, a supposed separation of the, the hand from the wrist. Uh, very, a much more simple, matter of fact, I can, um, yeah, it's in the cabinet, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna grab it, but um, okay. very simple effects, basically just a box. Um, but there's some precision to all those things. And, and um, you know, obviously start with good plans. I think our plans are, the ones in the series are pretty well uh, dimensioned. Um, we try not to leave too much to, uh, and then take your time uh, on the finishing. Um, people tend to rush when they're using paint. Um, when they say spray paint needs to sit in a single coat for 48 hours, uh, don't recoat it the second day uh, because it'll bubble up and you'll be frustrated. You'll have to sand it all down and start over. So it's just, it's, it's about patience. It's about being deliberate in what you're doing working with good plans, good materials. Um, uh, birch uh, plywood is, you know, the, the builders, uh, you know, the main medium. Mm -hmm. um, um, what's really tough, though, for the larger illusions was finding 3 8 inch stock. Uh, it's really hard to find anything that's actually 3 8 inch uh, when you're building zigzag or something of that nature. Half inch is too horsey and quarter inch isn't enough. And so... <laughs> Three eighths is that sweet spot that sometimes is pretty hard to find. When you're building these uh, <clears throat> tabletop versions, surely that's too thick. But what are you using? Um, I use a lot of you know the the covers here, for instance, are made from uh, masonite. Uh, the holders themselves are masonite. The bases 
I use a lot of MDF mm -hmm. uh, because it, it finishes nice. Um, obviously, uh, wood, uh, I don't use a lot of metal. Sometimes I use some aluminum, uh, depending on um, you know, the nature of the effect. Um, I, you know, I tend, you know, what I, what I live by, though, is super glue. Um, people are going to laugh at this, but um, I will tell you, this brand, I, I'm not a, I have no uh, commercial uh, benefit from saying this. Loctite um, Professional Liquid Super Glue, it's in the blue bottle. Uh, this stuff, A, it's, it's not forgiving, so once you put something together, don't expect to take it apart. Uh, but um, virtually everything I build um, from a tabletop perspective is put together with this and occasionally screws and uh, and other reinforcements. But I, you know, I live by the, I, I buy this stuff. Every time I go to the hardware store, I pick up another, uh, I got about 10 different tubes sitting around the room. Uh, but it works and it, and, it, and, it, and it sustains and it keeps things together. The, uh, the shift shape was another original effect of mine. Um, which was advertised at Stevens for a number of years. Um, this one is also, um, it's called the Celtic block uh, transposition, but it's basically a, a laser engraved block um, and uh, has a cover on it, but you can twist the cover over and then it, uh, it vanishes and produces a sphere. Um, Again, all this was pretty much put together um, with masonite and a little bit of a uh, little bit of popular and a lot of paint and a whole lot of magnets. <laughs> Very nice. Earth, earth magnets are I, I, I keep the earth magnet business pretty well um, flush. Yeah, I think magicians in general do <laughs> for sure. Exactly. <laughs> Can you make them thinner? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> exactly. All right, Craig. Is is there anything else you wanted to say or mention or, or show us tonight? No, I I I I I'm indebted to uh, Sammy Smith, um, publisher for the Linking Ring. He's been you know he was very gracious to accept my first submission. He said, "Hey, if you want to continue this, uh, we've gotten good feedback. I received a number of letters uh, from people across the." fruited plain in support of what we were doing. Um, uh, I'm sorry the series had to end <laughs> as it did, uh, only because I just ran out of things to, to do. But but uh, uh, I think, you know, it, it shows that it, it requires a lot of work and a lot of effort to put together one of those props and uh, a column to go with it. You know, it's a, it's yeah, and I, you know, if people are interested in learning more about the kind of work we do, you can visit uh, the Illusion Arts Magic Facebook page. Uh, certainly love to have people uh, comment. Um, I, I don't allow people to post on my site because once you open that door, um, the only exception is when somebody's performing one of my effects using one of my apparatus, um, I will share that uh, with others as well. But, um, you know, continue to follow me. I'm, I've got two articles in the works for future editions of The Linking Ring, two feature articles on two wonderful performers. Um, one in particular is uh, in Galena now, uh, P.T. Murphy. He's got a permanent show in Galena, Illinois, and uh, working on one on Steve Chesaday. Uh, Steve, a uh, well-known magician in the Chicago area as well. So I hope to those to be feature articles sometime in the future. Love the Linking Ring. Can't live without it. Read it every month. Uh, and, and it's a wonderful I, I, publication. I did want to pop up here. Uh, in the latest is issue, we talked about this earlier, but I just wanted to pop up the credit here. Uh, a story about Michael Baker, who is a, an amazing builder of props. And in that Okido style, you can see some amazing pictures in the article as well. Yeah, uh, Michael, uh, amazing guy, um, gracious, uh, and a real artist, and uh, and a performer. You know, he's... He, he, the article talks about his experience also performing, uh, performing on television uh, back uh, in the 70s. Uh, he had his own television show for a while as well. So fascinating guy. Hope you enjoy the article. And um, Ryan, it's been a real pleasure uh, connecting with you. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much, Craig. You have a great night. And I'll 
I love seeing the photos of your work in that Facebook group. Uh, it's amazing stuff. So thank you so much for sharing it. My pleasure. <laughs> that was Craig Bateen, uh, Petite Magia and Linking Ring and various articles. Uh, and just an amazing builder of props. Definitely check out that Facebook group. Again, Illusion Arts Magic. Search for that in the, in the old Facebook and pop up on the group and send an invitation or uh, request to Craig to join that group. Uh, if you like this, what is it? Table tabletop wizardry. <laughs> that was a neat way to, to describe it. All right, we're we got plenty more uh, here on the inside the ring tonight, and I appreciate you guys tuning in and commenting. Joel is here from Sydney, Australia. Hello, hello. Uh, and Tom says amazing tips. Yeah, and as Craig mentioned, it's it's those little things that you know as you learn. So it's nice to be able to talk with someone, and I'm I bet. If you go connect with Craig on Facebook, I bet he'd be willing to help answer those questions, just like you mentioned about the little measurements. So don't don't be shy to, to say uh, hello. Next up, what should I go to next? I like I like just random. I'm, I've mentioned this probably every single episode, but I love to randomly dig through the pages of the Linking Ring magazine and just see what hap uh, comes up. So here's one. I don't even know what I was searching for. Didn't work out, but I did find this. So, so check this out. This is a coded message, and it's a it's this unique code that that uh, this fella created. Uh, it was um, Larry uh, Larry Markin created this this code. So let's see if if you can translate this coded language here. Hmm? How about that. Does that make sense to you? Take a look. Some people get it right away. Some people takes a minute. <laughs> this is what uh, Larry calls the illusion of negative space. And it might help if I flip it around here. That might help uh, make it more clear to you. That's right. It says illusion. Illusion. <laughs> I just thought was, I'm a graphic designer, uh, so it just caught my eye, appealed to me. I thought that was a neat way to, to present something, and I, I could just think of ways to use this. And magicians love to talk about how you know, the brain interprets things in different ways. So this might be something you'd use in your presentations, just as a quick example. Uh, if you look at things from a different angle, it, uh, it becomes a little more clear. The illusion of negative space. So that is from the Linking Ring, of course, in July of 1983, The Illusion of Negative Space by Larry Markin. So he's got the uh, example graphic up there. I just recreated it. Uh, and hey, if you want, uh, if you want my uh, uh, printed, uh, my version to print out, I can send you that too. It's just a single sheet of paper I printed out. So get in touch if if you want the printout. Uh, I can I can share that with you. Uh, that's it. That was a quickie, but I thought that was a neat little thing. The next uh, thing I have to share with you. Where should I go next? So uh, how about this? How about uh, one of the newer segments on the show? It is time for the really really late news. <laughs> And I just realized I left my really late news on the printer. So here it is. <laughs> the really late news. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that age where I'm creeping up the bell curve that is the average age of IBM members. And I'm getting towards the middle. And uh, by nature, I'm also becoming a little more persnickety. And one of the things that bugs me is how the, all the new Magic releases get so much hype these days. You know, you get those newsletters and it's just, this is the greatest thing ever. Oh, this will change your life. This new Magic trick. Anyway, uh, so I thought, why don't I dig back into the archives and look at some of the hype for some of the Magic books that have now become classics. So we're going back to when there were brand new books coming off the press and what people have to say about them. So let's have a look. We're gonna start. 
In March 1939, this is in a column from M. S. Mahendra. <clears throat> in the beginning, at the end, the pageant. Meaningless phrases to many, perhaps, but to those fortunate enough to possess John Northern Hilliard's greater magic, they are phrases of significance. To me, the best part of the book. I have read and reread those three parts of greater magic, and each time I read, I find more wonderment. The magic of the written word is even greater than the magic of the hand. With cards, coins, thimbles, etc. John Northern Hilliard had a gift of expression few can ever hope to equal. He spent a lifetime in magic, and without that experience, he could not have given us greater magic. Carl Jones attempted a Herculean task when he published that book. Yet, Joe Dokes, with scarcely 18 months of study of magic to his credit, reads the book in a few hours and finds nothing to get excited about. To me, those three chapters, in the beginning, at the end, and the pageant, have created more inspiration for thought than anything I have read in years. There is more thought in the first two than in volumes of books or in a dozen lectures. I wonder if anyone else likes that part of the book best of all. It's high praise. That is high praise for greater magic. It's a thick book. We're only talking about the first chapter. Okay. Let's go to August 1952. Modern Coin Magic is the title of J.B. Bobo's latest book. It is being published by Carl Jones and will be off the press in August. And will be officially offered to the Magic Fraternity at the 7th Annual Convention of the Texas Association of Magicians which is being held in Fort Worth. It is reported that this is not only the greatest treatise on coin magic ever written, but is so complete in its coverage that it is doubtful that a book will ever be written in the future to equal it. I mean, that's kind of true here. 50, 52, no, 7, 60, Eight years later, <laughs> that's kind of, it's pretty close to true. So anyway, there's more. Uh, Bobo's home is in Texarkana, Texas, and he is a member of the Fort Worth IBM ring. Therefore, it is appropriate that this book should be introduced in Texas at TAOM convention. He will be on hand to demonstrate some of the effects described in the books. And arrangements have been made with Carl Jones, the publisher, to bind the first book off the press with a special deluxe cover and gilt edge all its leaves. The printer will designate this book as copy number one. Copy both on the cover and the spine. It will be personally autographed by the author J.B. Bobo and placed in an elaborate transparent box and then turned over to the TAOM. In, in time it will become a collector's item. I, I have never heard of this book, this edition of the book, and I surely somebody has it. Who, who's got it? T let me know. Mike Cavity's got it. David Sandy's got it. I don't know. Somebody's got it. <laughs> I, there's more. This is interesting. This is interesting. So uh, Ren Clark, the president of the TAOM, announced that Bobo's book number one will be sold at auction and part of the proceeds will go towards the starting of an IBM benevolent fund and the balance will be sent to Eddie Cleaver in appreciate of the great contributions that he is making to the Lincoln Ring. At the mid-year meeting of the Board of Trustees, a plan will be presented for the creation, building, and operation of an IBM Benevolent Fund to be used in helping needy members of the organization. So, it was so that was so cool to me that it was the J.V. Bobo's Modern Coin Magic Special Deluxe Edition that got started that whole uh, Benevolent Fund program. That that was a neat little tidbit of history that <laughs> I like stumbling upon in these segments. Okay, moving on. Let's more really late news. Let's go to August 1976. Mark Wilson, well known to the public as one of today's master magicians, with a staff of competent people has put together one of the best 
how to do magic courses I've ever seen. Among his co-authors were Walter B. Gibson and U.F. Jen Grant. The course consists of 472 pages, faultlessly offset printed. <laughs> of course it's faultlessly. Why would they print? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Bound in heavy vinyl covers to open flat while you follow instructions. Most important, the illustrations are keyed to the text, so you see how as you read how. And that I agree. Mark Wilson, Course of Magic, one of my first books. Used to get it from the library. That was a great feature. That it was just text illustration. It was like before video. That that was the video. Like it was good. Anyway. <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly with Mark when he says, I sincerely believe you will find this the best illustrated, most easily understood, and most completely developed method ever produced for learning the art of magic. Yeah, it kind of was. It kind of was a trend, uh, like a leap forward in the beginner magic books uh, world. This is not merely a beginner's course, for there is much of value in it for the man well embarked on the magic as a hobby pursuit. No matter how well read you are, you'll find tricks here you didn't know, methods you were not aware of, or didn't realize their effectiveness. I am pleased to endorse the Mark Wilson Course in Magic as one of the finest works ever produced in many a long year, and it deserves an honored place in your library. And I think that holds true because there's a lot of people who go back to the Mark Wilson Course in Magic time and time again to dig out some... So far, these, these reviews are pretty on point. Yes, they say a lot of grand things. But the, I mean, I'm biased because I picked out books that have stood the test of time. So obviously the reviews should be good. But anyway, moving on. January 1960. More glowing reviews for Di Vernon's Inner Secrets of Card Magic by Lewis Ganson. 76 pages, six and a half by nine inches. Three dollars. It was three dollars when it came out. <laughs> 62 halftone illustrations showing the exact position of the hands in accomplishing the necessary slights. And there are some almost fabulous slights explained. I don't know if that's a typo. Almost fabulous slights. I'm not sure why it would say that, but anyway. The paper is a good slick book paper. I don't know like why... Anyway, <laughs> it's a good slick paper. I like it. Uh, the, cover, the cover is a modest one, being a sort of mulberry shade of art paper embossed like a leather and stamped in gold. He very is a John Braun, a very texture-oriented person in his reviewing. This is part one of a book to be published in four parts, and we can only wish that the undertaking had been financed by the Bank of England so that it would have been possible to have them all uh, at one time. And uh, let's see, you know, lots of lots of good stuff, good stuff. Uh, you know, uh, the Vernon touch. Uh, oh yeah, for anything his talented fingers touch. He leaves flecked with pure gold. I can give it no better recommendation. Type praise. Type. So I think there's a there's a lot of hype uh, throughout the history. A lot of hype. But this one takes the cake. This one takes the cake. February 1945. Listen to this. This is this is a review to end all reviews. There are very few really great classics of magic. And we refer to those books which teach, not merely explain, many tricks. Outstanding among these classics are Our Magic by Masklin and Devant, Neo Magic by S.H. Sharp, and Showmanship for Magicians, and now The Trick Brain, both by Daryl Fitzke. Our Magic served the time for which it was written, but that was 34 years ago. Since then, the theater and the entertainment world have seen radical changes. Practically every type of show business has progressed with the times, has accepted the changes, although sometimes reluctantly, and has marched with the times. Not so magic. Generally, magic and magicians are still 25 years behind the times. We haven't the space to elaborate on that. 
we consider the trick brain the most important work since our magic. The trick brain will not only take magic as a form of entertainment out of the past, but will carry it into the future. For it is the book of the future. It is a prophecy of things to come. And Profitsky, considered one of the most able writers on magic, is the prophet. That's that's a review. That's a review. And they're not they're not done. They're not done. Um, they say um, there's a perhaps the most good they're trying to balance out their praise. Perhaps the most critical review of the trick brain thus far appeared in the Phoenix number 73 by Bruce Elliott and Walter Gibson. The main idea behind the trick brain is the section called by that title. For it is here Mr. Fitzky endeavors to show how a trick plot and method may be developed methodically. In the writing field, several mechanical methods for developing plots exist, which have never... Uh... Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. This, this is... This is the, the, I got mixed up. This is you from Phoenix. Um, in the writing field, several mechanical methods for developing plots exist, which have never been successfully applied by commercial writers of fiction. It is with this similarity that Bruce and Walter take issue. They say these, referring to plot finders, are too mechanical. And even when the device has given one the whole setup, there still remains the tiny factor of the creative idea which must be added. So they're saying this doesn't help create ideas. It just that leaves you stuck with having to figure it out anyway. Well, we must disagree, of course, because this is the... Anyway. <laughs> Not so much on the score of such writing aids being useless, but on the point that the trick brain does supply the creative urge. He, he's, done, he's laid it all out, yada, 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 he's laid it all out. Yeah, it'll take some work. The trick brain will stimulate thought. And unless you are entirely devoid of imagination, it will bring about very radical changes in your outlook on magic and your program or act. Again, we say, and this is in all capital letters, the trick brain is the prophecy and Daryl Fitzky the prophet of a new era in magic. That is how you hype a magic book, let me tell you. And that is from 1945, so this is by no means a new trend in magic. <laughs> I thought that was quite a review. And I, and I looked up the trick brain because it's been on my mind lately. And just tonight, as I was last minute preparing for the show, I found one more little addition. So that was February 1945. And they said in that article, perhaps the most critical review of the trick brain thus far appeared in the Phoenix. Well, I don't know what the linking ring uh, deadlines were like back in 1945, but one month prior in the linking ring was a very, very critical review of the trick brain uh, by Tom Boyer. And it was, it was very long, and, and I've already gone too long in this segment, so I've cut it down. Just one chunk of that very critical review <clears throat> from January 1945 by Tom Boyer, he says, as to whether this imposing volume will fulfill any worthwhile purpose, we recall that when tomorrow's racetrack winners are offered for sale, the cynical are tempted to inquire why the vendor doesn't follow his own tips and retire to luxury. In the same way, when someone writes a book on trick inventing, a natural query might be as to what inventing he has done. We have never heard that Fitzky is particularly prominent among those lines. That was just one little, little barb from the review, full of them. Uh, so, it's not all hype, not all hype. I like that, you know, often reviewers uh, in the Linking Ring and elsewhere, they like to focus on the positive, which is generally a good idea. But uh, in, that, in that case, Tom Boyer was not having any of it. He was not at all impressed with the book, and he made that very clear. So that uh, that concludes my I just digging into some old magic reviews. I thought that was a fun little uh, adventure. Hopefully you enjoyed that. That was the really late magic news. And the reason that the, the trick brain was on my mind, I'm going to take a quick diversion here as we're coming near the end. 
the trick brain system is that you're able to connect the uh, uh, you know, a method a presentation and a prop or something like that and kind of randomly mix it up and see what happens like it's it's a way to kick your creative brain into solving problems and 20 years ago I was publishing my own magazine called Half Baked which uh, quite understandably you may have never heard of <laughs> but it was all about creativity and magic and I was reading the trick brain back then and I actually tried it and I, I didn't think it was quite as hopeless as Tom Boyer uh, thought and I didn't think it was prophetic but I thought it was interesting and I worked on that system and developed that system and uh, combining some different ideas from different people anyway I ended up creating uh, kind of my version of the trick brain system to create magic and that was 20 years ago and just today basically I have launched it again 20 years later i've republished it and i call it the random magic generator and i thought i'd just take a quick second here to show uh if i can share the old screen here and bring this in this is the random magic generator uh, it says this machine generates random magic trick ideas and this is very much the same concept as the trick brain but it's just way easier because you don't have lists and cards and like, it was all manual obviously in 1945. So it presents you a sentence that could be a magic trick. You can see right there it says the amazing artist does juggling with a hat and sausage. And it might be nonsense that's kind of nonsensical. It's a bunch of random pieces that are shoved together in a random order well not a random order um, and it's up to you your brain to look at that and think hmm what would that look like? Hmm, what if you're juggling a hat and sausage? Maybe that would be something. Uh, and you kind of ponder on it. Just, just like the trick brain, you know, the, the critique being that it doesn't supply you with the answer. Well, it, this is the same thing. It doesn't supply you with the answer, but it tries to kick your brain, give you a whack upside the head, and trigger uh, that original idea. It gets you thinking outside of the path that you might normally think. And so this is something you can just press the button here and come up with a new idea. So a new magic trick. I've never seen these before. I have no idea what's coming. The amazing motor biker does Benson Bull with a window and a bone. So a Benson Bull is like, you know, the bowl on the table and things appear under it. Um, but it's with a window. Maybe that means a clear bowl. <laughs> so you're doing a clear bowl. Like, you know, Jason Latimer did the clear cups. Uh, you can have a clear Benson Bull and a bone. Well, maybe it's a dog bowl. What would Benson Bull with a dog bowl? Maybe that's a whole new presentation. You know, Benson Bowl with a dog bowl, you use uh, little rubber balls like a dog toy might chew, and you can finish with a, with a production of a bone, and then maybe like a rice bowl, you could flip it over and pour out a uh, kibble. There you go, Benson Bowl as, as a dog bowl. I wouldn't have had that idea if not for that. I'll try, try another one. The amazing bureaucrat does collectors with whiteboard and a comb. <laughs> so collectors is where you know things appear in between usually a card trick things appear in between uh, your collectors whiteboard and a comb and the amazing bureaucrat this is actually an idea from Tom Stone where I picked it up uh, he called it the round table and it's imagining how other people might present a magic trick in order to trigger your creativity so a bureaucrat would do things in a very different way than I might. And so I think, well, now how can we do the collectors but do it with a lot of, you know, red tape and a lot of diligent process, you know, what would that look like? So that's, uh, anyway, so collectors with whiteboard, well, what, what if you could draw on a white, you don't have to use all the ideas either. So it could be, you have a whiteboard, what if you drew four lines on a whiteboard and then you drew a circle down here in the whiteboard and you like covered the circle for a second and it reappeared in between the lines and I don't know vanished <laughs> I don't know it's that's the thing this is about the quantity of ideas more than the quality it just stirs stirs your brain and gets you thinking about new things so this is this is as I said my version of the trick brain 
and I just launched it today and I would uh, uh, love for people to check it out and I just realized I didn't uh, type in the address to share it here. You can find this online at random.magictipsandtricks.com and popping that up on screen for you to see random.magictipsandtricks.com check it out this is this is the trick brain without all the fussing around so you can see whether you agree with the the prophetic review or the nothing of significance review <laughs> for this system and uh, how it works so enjoy uh you're welcome to that and i would love to hear if anything comes of it coming up next on uh we have two more i have two more things for you here tonight and i'm going to take a break because i'm going a mile a minute here i always get excited the longer the show goes on i get more and more excited because i'm just having fun sharing some magic so i'm going to take a break and uh hand it over to my regular uh appearing columnists on here and this is mike powers with his card corner now this month Mike Powers Card Corner does not have a video to go with it. And at first I was I was, you know, a little bit like sad about that that he would be appearing on the show. Uh but my partner said, "Well, why don't you just use an older video?" Because Mike's been doing this since uh, like 2007, like before internet video was a thing that people did. Mike Powers has been doing it. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, you can check up the whole archive, I think. So I went back and I picked one out and I picked one out that I thought was in an interesting trick and I particularly like this one because we get to know more about uh, Maria. So let's look at the card corner. Welcome card lovers. My wife is shuffling her deck. This is my lovely wife, Maria, and we're going to demonstrate the, uh, uh, the item from the card corner column in September of 2020. As you can see, it's a zoomable trick. We're on a zoom conference right now. I want to let you know that Maria is a uh, PhD from 4F convention, having performed there three times. Uh, she's won some trophies um, uh, for performances at the Magi Fest. She's a Chavez graduate under Neil Foster, uh, and she's been in magic more years than I have, which gripes me, but it's true. Did I get everything? Oh, you forgot uh, Jeff McBride's Magic Mystery School. And, and a graduate of Jeff McBride's school as well. So we're gonna try to demonstrate a, a zoomable trick, the trick of September 2020. So Maria, take your cards. I know you have a deck with you. I asked you to bring one and give them a little shuffle. Okay. And then hold the cards up like this. Can you see that my cards are all uh, mixed up? You can, put your, you can put your cards down. And uh, I'm gonna move the camera angle down on the table here. So put the cards face down on the table. You can see my cards, you can see your cards as well. So we're gonna cut uh, oh, about half the cards or so, uh, maybe a little bit more than half to the side and get rid of those cards. And now you have a packet in front of you. Um, we're each gonna count our cards. So count your cards face down and silently. Okay, I count a little quicker there. I, I have 15, how did you do? 15. 15 as well, very interesting. We have synchronicity right off the bat. Um, let's do this, take the top card and deal it face down in front of you and follow that with three more cards face down, making a little pile of four cards. Uh, whoops, I got five there. Now go ahead and shuffle up the cards in your hand and deal a pile to the left of that pile, four cards face down, and shuffle them one more time and deal another pile of four to the right. And you can put the rest of the cards away. There was, there was some extra cards there. Okay, now you can pick up any pile, any pile that you want, pick up a pile, Put it onto the center pile. Pick up the combined center pile now, the big one, and add it to the other pile. And I'm gonna do the same thing, mirroring you. You made the choices, you did the shuffling, we both shuffled the packs. 
Uh, now we're going to eliminate 11 of these 12 cards using the famous down and under deal. So here's how it works. You're going to deal a card face down on the table. That's the down card. You take the next card and put it under the other packet. Yeah, like that. So that's down and then under. Now we're going to do it again, down and under, and then just keep going. I'll just do my own thing over here. I'm not looking at you. I'm kind of making sure I do it right. Just keep going until you get down to one card. Down and under, down and under, down. Okay, I've, I've got one final card. I went a little bit faster than you did. Have you got one card there? Yep. Now this is, gets interesting. After all that shuffling and you're, you're in a totally different place, we have arrived at a single card. I'm going to slowly turn my card facing towards you. You turn your card facing towards me. And let's see what has happened here. I'm seeing an ace of diamonds on both sides. I'm going to come back on camera here so we can talk again and you can feel free to come back. Uh, so that is the trick from September of 2020. It's a zoomable trick. It works just like that. And in fact, if you look at the write up, you'll see that there's an extension under some circumstances. You can actually uh, take the packet on the table, strip it down to nine cards and get another match. So uh, read the column and you'll see how to do that. Meanwhile, Mike Powers, my lovely wife, Maria Schweder, we're signing off. See you down the way. And that was Schmooze from uh, the Card Corner in September 2020, page 96. Obviously a trick for Zoom. So if you're thinking, oh, where was that all, all year? That's, that's where it was, hidden in the Lincoln Ring, September 2020. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad uh, Mike was able to be a part of the show. It's, uh, I appreciate uh, that he allowed me to, to make use of his Card Corner videos. And I have, I say this every month, an open invitation. Anyone who wants to record your video of you performing or demonstrating something you learned from the Linking Ring, I would absolutely love to feature it on this show. Uh, as you can see, it's it's mostly me here, so there's, there's room. <laughs> there's room for you to be a part of the show as well. I have one final thing to share with you, and then I'm gonna sign off for the night. And I'm gonna call this my official uh, a uh, hidden gem for tonight. So this is one that I found when I was looking for something else. And it uses uh, money. Now, I'm a Canadian. <laughs> this uses American money. Uh, I didn't have American money, so I had to print my own. <laughs> so, however, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I printed it uh, large enough that it's legit. I think you're allowed to reproduce money if it's like 120% larger. Uh, so I'm, I hope I did that. Then I'm not broadcasting live a felony in a foreign country. Hopefully. Hopefully it's legit. Uh, but I noticed when I was, uh, you have to count, uh, be able to count these bills, and I noticed they kind of, the paper stuck a little bit. So I actually had to put some, some baby powder on them to make them be able to s not stick. Um, because I find if you are carrying counterfeit money, it's good to have it covered in an unknown white powder. I think that's a good tip as well. Uh, I'm going to show you this trick and let's see if I can do the old split screen. I'm advancing my technology on the show tonight. So um, this is one of those little little story tricks you carry with you in your wallet. You can say, you know, uh, I had a friend of mine, Charlie, and uh, he owed me eight bucks and he's been ducking me ever since. <laughs> eight, eight bucks, come on, man. Uh, but I uh, bumped into him at the bar one night and I saw him with his... The, his cash was on the table and right in front of him. And so I came up to him and said, hey, hey, Charlie, uh, you know, how about that uh, eight bucks you owe me? And, and he was looking at the money on, on, a, on a table there and he had one, two, three, four bucks, four bucks. I said, oh, how about that eight bucks you owe me? He says, oh, oh, Ryan, yeah. Uh, yeah, I got your eight bucks right here. He goes, look, 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 look. Okay, look, that's, uh, that's one, two, uh, three, four bucks, okay, and then that's uh, that's five, six, uh, seven, and eight. That's that's eight bucks. 
Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Charlie. Sure. Uh, tell you what, Charlie. I'll, I'll I'll take it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll take take the eight bucks. I appreciate that. But just to make sure, I wanted to count it. Is that okay? Duh. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, I count it. Okay, all right, Charlie, we'll count it. So uh, let's see. That's uh, that's one, uh, two, three, four. Okay, and that's five. And then five plus five is ten. So that's actually too much, Charlie. You gave me too much. But I'll tell you what. You know what? It's only eight bucks. Forget it. I don't. I don't want to take your money. I'll, I'll give you back your eight bucks. Let's see. Hang on. That's that's five. Okay. Six, seven, and that's eight. But you don't mind if I keep the change, eh, Charlie? Great. I'll just keep the change. There you go. That is uh, what is what is that called? Uh, uh, Buccarino two. It is Buccarino two uh, by. Where's my reference card? Buccarino 2 by Larry West, and that is from March 1983. I don't, again, I don't remember what I was looking for at the time, but I ended up finding this little gem. And if you are in the U.S. of A, you have everything you need, uh, hopefully. I don't want to judge your financial situation, but you need uh, $18 in order to perform this trick. <laughs> And it's something you can carry in your wallet uh, along with the rest of your cash. All you need is the, the dollar bills and you're good to go. So that is Larry West, Buccarino number two. Larry West, of course, Emerson and West, that's the West. So the guy who created all those packet tricks, you know, Color Monty, they, I think they sold you know 50,000 of those or something, 500,000, I forget what, uh, incredible amount. I was listening to a lecture by uh, Arthur Emerson I was telling a few stories about those days and how he he was the story guy, Arthur Emerson was the story guy, and Larry West was the trick guy. That's how they worked together. Larry West, uh, according to, to Emerson, could take any trick and and take out all the moves. <laughs> this is not so. I mean, it's like a like a packet trick. It's got a lot of counts in it, but um, I thought that was a neat little thing. Unfortunately, I'm not sure it'll work for me as a Canadian, but that is my hidden gem for tonight, Buccarino. And oh, sorry, Glenn, I missed your comment. Uh, he said, love the knowing, Mike is brilliant. That's Mike's uh, just brand new release, the knowing, which is a, a one of those versions of the 21 card trick that will uh, stump anyone who thinks they know what's happening. So it's a good one to use after someone says, hey, let me show you a trick. You can, you can uh, <laughs> follow up with uh, this one from Mike. So that is it for the Inside the Ring tonight. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. And I look forward to seeing you again next month on the third Tuesday for the next edition, episode 11 of Inside the Ring. This is Ryan signing off. And I really need to figure out some sort of catchphrase to say at the end of my shows. Like, uh... We'll be ringing you. No. <laughs> that was ring-a-dong dandy. You know what? I'm going with that for now. I'll see you next month. <laughs>